Privation of our freedom is everyone's concern. Professor Dr. Matthias de Smet, Professor of uh, Clinical Psychology on the University of uh, Ghent in Belgium. You're quite famous at the moment. Some people say so. Yes. I'm famous in a small group, I think. Well, I don't know about Corona that. Corona critical people. You're a clinical psychologist, but now from that clinical psychology, you move to mass psychology. Yes. To mass formation. Yes. How, how did you make this, this shift? Well, well, people seemed to be able to see that they were really in the grip of absurd theories or absurd beliefs. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, uh, this phenomenon could not be explained just at the level of individual psychology. You had to take into account the, the effect or the impact of the group to which they belong mm -hmm. to understand how people could become so blind for things that were blatantly wrong or absurd. And that's, that's how I actually became interested in mass psychology. Started to investigate it, to read about it in the first place. You were interested before the corona crisis. I was, you were already yeah, yeah, interested yes, in yes, it. Yes, yes, I was lecturing already on, on mass formation before the corona crisis. Suddenly, the entire society was in the grip of a narrative which was based on mathematical models and statistics that, in my opinion, immediately were clearly wrong or utterly absurd in many respects, without people noticing it. And, um, the strange thing was that it took me a few months before I really, in my opinion, could hit the nail and see that what was going on in society was this large-scale process of mass formation. It's strange that it took you so long. Yes, it's strange. It. Yes, yes, yes. Because that's... in the beginning we were all yes. a bit in the grip of, yes. the, of the story. Yes, indeed. And that's a strange thing with mass formation. Yeah. Uh, an entire society is in the grip of it. And some people can, in one way or another, take a little bit of distance and slowly start to see what is happening, what is going on. I immediately had the feeling that there was something wrong with the narrative, with yeah. the corona narrative. But it took me a few months before I could really pinpoint and say, like, yes, that's what's happening. It's a process of mass formation. What was for you the first warning? This is not right. A few months before the crisis, I already had the feeling that something was about to happen in society. Oh, really? Yes, yes. The end of uh, December 2019, I had the feeling that all the negative parameters in society were exponentially increasing and that something was about to happen. I had the feeling that the complex system of society was reaching a tipping point. So I went to the bank, paid back my mortgage. Really? And then two months later, the corona crisis started. and. From the first week, I wrote an opinion paper in which I warned for what was going on. I said that the anxiety, the fear of the virus was worse than the, more dangerous than the virus itself. Uh, I started to investigate the statistics and I also got a master in statistics after my master in clinical psychology. So I know something about statistics. From the first moment, they had a feeling like, look, these statistics and these mathematical models, they dramatically overrate the dangerousness of the virus. And then like, by the end of May 2020, in my opinion, this was actually proven beyond doubt. Okay. Just because the initial models predicted that by the end of May 2020, 60 or 70,000 people would die in a country such as Sweden if the country didn't go into lockdown. And that didn't happen at all. 6,000 people died. So that was the moment when I fully started to focus on the question, what is going on at the psychological level in society? And that's why I, when I came up with my uh, a little theory on mass formation, yes. Okay. We're suffering from a bit of headwind here. Yes. I suggest that we, uh, we go and we, uh, we look for a nice and calm place Wonderful. out of the wind. Matthias, the psychology of totalitarianism. 
This is uh, the English version. You must be very proud because there are people lauding you, like uh, 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 Robert Malone, like uh, uh, Peter McCullough, Robert Kennedy Jr., also Eric Clapton, uh, who really like your work. It's been quite a year for you, hasn't it? Yes. It was quite the year, yes. It's a strange feeling, a strange yeah. experience of seeing how uh, a little theory on mass formation is spread around the world in, uh, in, uh, during the last one year, months, maybe, yeah, yes, yeah. Or, or ten months, yes. Yeah. Uh, earlier on we were talking about fear, the fear-mongering that happened uh, in the beginning of, uh, of the corona crisis, where you made the click to say this is like the, the mass formation happening. Is fear one of the most powerful emotions that can be triggered? What happened was not so much, I think, that new fear and new anxiety emerged in the crisis, but it was that an already existing anxiety and fear in the population uh, was reorganized and redirected at an object. Or a mass formation usually only emerges in a society or can only be provoked in a society uh, if there is already a high level of fear and anxiety. And then it's easy, once the population uh, is confronted with a lot of anxiety, it's easy to direct all that anxiety in one time at an, at an object, for instance a, a virus, but it could all also be the Jews, or it could also be like in, in Nazi Germany in the, in, the, in the beginning of the 20th century, or the aristocracy in the Soviet Union, or the witches during the witch hunts, yeah. or the, you know, uh, the Muslims during the Crusades, it doesn't matter. So what happens, I think, is that when a, when a mass formation emerges, all this anxiety that is already present in a population is suddenly directed at one object, and from there on, leaders of masses can easily use that at their own advantage. The first step in the process is usually that many people feel socially isolated. That's usually the first step. We've seen the emergence of a more and more excessive industrialization of the world. And we've seen uh, how more and more technology was used. And the excessive use of technology that more and more at a psychological level disconnected people from each other and also from the natural environment. And once people are in this state, the state which is called a socially atomized state, uh, uh, to use the term of, uh, that the Frankfurter Schule and Hannah Arendt used, once people are in this state, they start to um, deal with a lack of meaning making in life, a feeling of purposelessness, and also, and that's very extremely important, a specific kind of anxiety, frustration and aggression what we call, often call, a free-floating anxiety, frustration and aggression. Not binded to something you can... Exactly, really see. Yeah. exactly. People feel anxious, frustrated and aggressive, without knowing what they feel anxious, frustrated and aggressive for. It's that state that makes people vulnerable and sensitive to mass formation. If under these conditions a narrative is distributed through the mass media, indicating an object of anxiety and providing a strategy to deal with this object of anxiety, all this free-floating anxiety connects to the object of anxiety yeah, and bind, there is a yeah. huge willingness to participate in the strategy to deal with this object of anxiety. Yeah. And once this happens, something even more important happens. They have the feeling to... To belong. Yes, to belong and to be connected to each other. Yeah. They have the feeling that they fight a heroic collective battle yeah. with the object of anxiety and a new kind of social bond emerges yeah. because there is a strong bond between every individual separately and the collective mm. and the longer the mass formation exists the more it sucks away all the psychological energy from the connections between people and invests it all in the connection between the individuals and the collective and meaning that in the end people are radically willing to report every other individual yeah. of whom they feel that it is not loyal enough to the state. Yeah. That's so typical for the end stage of mass formation. What's the way out of this mass formation? Well, you know, mass formation is a kind of hypnosis. It's induced by the yeah. voice. It's, it's an extremely strong phenomenon. It's, it focuses all the attention on one point which, just like in hypnosis, makes people unaware of the, of the rest of reality, of everything that is outside their narrow focus of attention. Once you understand that mass formation and hypnosis are identical, uh, the only thing you can do when mass formation emerges is to continue to speak out. History shows us, and that was something that was described by Gustave Le Bon already, 
that the people who are not in the grip of mass formation typically try to show the people in the mass formation how absurd the narrative is that they believe in, but Le Bon also mentions that these people usually won't succeed in waking up the people in the mass formation. Because if other people continue to speak out, they will typically make sure that the mass hypnosis or the mass uh, formation doesn't go so deep that people start to commit cruelties towards everyone who doesn't go along with them. That's the effect a dissonant voice has on the masses. It's a crucial, it's the most important effect. And history shows us like, if the dissonant voice stops to speak out, which happened, for instance, mm -hmm. in 1930 in the Soviet Union and in 1935 yeah, all the opposition in was, Nazi Germany, yeah. Yeah, all the opposition was silenced. Yeah. And within a period of about six months, in both countries, the cruelties started. Uh, I wanted to go uh, after this to Malaga. There we have uh, an icon of disruptiveness and uh, who broke the mold, which is uh, Pablo Picasso. Uh, and he would have spoken I think uh, loudly uh, against this. Um, I wanted to pick up on, on what you said about uh, Nazism and, uh, and, and communism. There we saw that artists like Picasso, there, there were a lot of artists who collaborated Indeed. with the regimes, which is very strange because you would think that artists would go against this yeah, kind yeah, of... Yes, 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 uh, indeed. Even these intellectuals and these artists that's, that strongly opposed these ideologies that ultimately led to Nazism and to Stalinism, changed their mind once the mass formation emerged and the, and the process of totalitarization started. That's a strange thing. Mirlo describes this in his book, A Rape of the Mind. Mm -hmm. Once this mass formation emerges, suddenly change their mind, mentally surrender, and suddenly start to become convinced that this new ideology, this totalitarian ideology, is not so bad. What's the difference? Why do some buy into the narrative so easily and other ones say, no, I don't believe it. No, that's, 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 that's the big question. I know people who wrote books about uh, biofascism and techno-totalitarianism before the corona crisis. And suddenly, well, when all these phenomena actually started to happen, mm -hmm. they suddenly changed their mind. And they even smeared the reputation of the people who went well, against this ideology. Yeah. So that's a strange thing. But why it happens, why some people go along with the masses and other people refuse to go along and resist, defy the masses. That's a question that has been asked time and time again throughout the last 200 years. And nobody is nobody. really capable of giving us a, a satisfying answer. We'll ask the ghost of Pablo Picasso yes, when we go we to will. Malaga. That's a wonderful idea. Yeah. Picasso was born here and he was known for his rebellious view on, mm. on the arts. Something I missed the last two years in all the arts, I must say, you know, there's the rock and roll, the theater, there were very, very few artists who spoke out against all the measures that were taken during the COVID pandemic. Do you agree? The reason why art exists in society and the function, the responsibility also that art has in a, in a society is rather to break through every kind of conformism and create ever new and always changing new symbols and forms in society. And then now, during this crisis, it seemed as if they collectively forgot what the function of art is. And it seems as if they all, in a strange way, I was also baffled by it, in mm -hmm. a strange way, chose to conform yeah. and to go along um, with the mainstream dominant uh, narrative. Picasso, he, he did something totally different. Mm -hmm. He wasn't subsidized. He did it all Picasso. on his own. Yes. Is it because nowadays in Europe, most of the artists are living from, from, from subsidies, be it 
directly or be it uh, through the uh, the cultural uh, uh, scene do you think that's that's why they followed the narrative in, in the way they did no <laughs> that might have something to do with it uh -huh. but um, if you look at uh, the emergence of totalitarian systems uh, in, the, in the first half of the 20th century then also a lot of uh, artists uh, conformed to the system or, or went along with the system bought into the narrative I think and I doubt whether they were highly subsidized at that moment. Mm. I think there is something else that might be more important. I don't want to say it definitely plays a role, of course. We can make a very fundamental choice and, and, and between either going with uh, against the stream or, or swimming against the tide or doing the opposite, going along mm -hmm. with the largest group in society. And I think that for a long time already, artists were not used anymore to really uh, swim against the tide. Mm. To me, it seems that Many artists, in one way or another, chose to the mainstream social ideal. And during this crisis, this only became more evident and more, and more visible, I think. There were two exemptions, which I, I saw in, in people who spoke out uh, against the narrative. One is Van Morrison, um, the singer, and the other one is Eric Clapton. And Eric Clapton even talked about you. Did you ever talk with him? No. I know he talked about me. I've seen some interviews where he talked about me. He liked my, uh, my book or my theory on mass formation. He even wrote a, a note on the, on the cover of my book now. That's strange, that's extremely strange. Yes, that the rest chose to shut up and, and, and to remain silent or even actually really went along with the, with the narrative. Especially because a lot of artists always say, can art save the world? And now they were silent. They were. Art should be one example of truth speech in society. Yeah. And it wasn't in this, in this, in this crisis. It, uh, to me, it seemed that they collectively failed to take their responsibility as an artist. Yes. But because we really were dealing with, with a, well, a pensée unique, a group yeah. thing, group, group thing. thing, and exactly at that moment, we need art yeah. to break through the group thing, to introduce like a new discourse. And exactly at the moment, society needed them, I think. They failed to they be failed there. Us. Yes. They failed us. They failed us. I wonder if what Picasso would have would have. Ah, uh, that's a good question. Yes, that's a good question because it it became clear to me how hard it is to predict actually who yeah. uh, would choose to uh, go along with the group think or speak the opposite up. speak yeah. up speak out. Yes, and of course Picasso was someone who uh, his entire life throughout his life he constantly time and time again chose to create something new. As far as I know. He never chose to buy into the, the mainstream narrative yeah. or the mainstream style mm -hmm. in art. So we, we can only hope that he would have uh, chosen to speak out. But we cannot be sure, I think. You never can be no, sure. You, can, you never, never can. can be sure, no. We only can hope. Good old Pablo. Yeah. First we go to this teteria, ah, ah, ah. which is a tea house, traditional tea house. Uh, this is the biggest tea house in, uh, in Malaga. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of uh, different tea. It's probably something that stems from the old... Uh, from the old tradition uh, of the, of the Moorish. The, the Moorish, the Moorish times. Yes. Yeah, yeah. This is the Moroccan version, the Moroccan tea. The Arabs were here for about 800 years, so it's still uh, something that they left here. I think this is like a ceremony, mm. as they do it in in, uh, in Africa, in, mm. in Northern Africa, as they do it also in uh, in Japan. Mm. Did we lose this kind of ceremonies in our society? We lost touch with uh, rituals and the importance mm -hmm. of rituals, I think. And that's only logical, I believe. If you just uh, consider our dominant view on the world, mm -hmm. which is a very materialist, mechanist view, 
I believe there is no reason whatsoever to believe that rituals could be important. And still we need it. We have rituals in, in religion mm. still, but there's mm. no introduction of new rituals. I believe there is. Yeah? Okay. I believe there are new rituals, but we do not recognize them as such. Certain corona measures. Mm. Everybody agreed or everybody knew somewhere. Even the experts uh, acknowledged that in the end, they were primarily symbolic measures. Mm. And they functioned as a ritual. They functioned as a ritual, I think, because ritualistic behavior is exactly a kind of behavior that is uh, meaningless from a pragmatic point of view, that has no pragmatic purpose, uh, and that demands a sacrifice of the individual, a sacrifice through which the individual shows that its own individual interests are less important than the collective interests. That has always been the function of a ritual. It makes me think of the wearing of a mask. The wearing of a mask, for instance, is, is, one, is one example, yes. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And also the, the, the closing of the hotels and the restaurants. Uh -huh. the, the, the Minister of Health in Belgium mm -hmm. just reported just like that, that it was a symbolic measure, he said. Mm -hmm. That it wouldn't really stop the spreading of the virus, uh, but that it was a symbolic measure to remind everyone uh, that there was such a thing as a virus and that we should uh, fight this collective battle with the virus. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you can see in several respects that we need behavior, symbolic behavior, that through which we show that we want to sacrifice something of our own egoistic interest for the collective. But the problem is, if a ritual is recognized to be a ritual, we usually will be aware that uh, it should be limited, that we shouldn't go too far in it. If we participate in the rituals without really knowing that we that participate in the ritual, then it can be without limit. And that's what we see exactly in every kind of totalitarian system, in every kind of mass formation. There is like a kind of ritualistic behavior which is not recognized as such and which is truly pushed to the limit. But it's pushed to the limit by the masses itself. People do it yes. voluntarily. Yes. They follow each other. They're like yes, lemmings. Yes, 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 yes. They're like lemmings throwing themselves off the rocks. Absolutely. On the one hand, um, the masses participate voluntarily in the, in the rituals, but on the other hand, also the leaders constantly impose new rituals. I believe in this way, if we can introduce a new view on the world, which re-appreciates uh, the function of a, of a ritual. In another way than we used to know rituals in a religious way. It depends, I think. I think if you're talking about institutionalized, dogmatic religion, then yes, then yeah. the, the ritual will have a different function. But if you're talking about the seminal, original, religious experience, which was actually also like a, an experience in which uh, there is like an open-minded uh, contact with something that escapes all rational understanding and something that touches the, the intrinsic mystery of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the human existence, I believe in that respect there is nothing wrong with religion. And that even it's very similar, for instance, to the experience that was the basis of science. Mm. Someone like Max Planck stressed that in some of his works, that he said literally, I believe that science ultimately arrives where religion once started. In an authentic, personal contact with something that escapes rationality and that transcends rationality. It's at this point, I think, when we start to become aware of the fact that all rational understanding, our rational understanding is limited and that we need a different way to know the world. A way that is not so much, in which we not so much try to push or to, to to impose our rational, the categories of our rational understanding to everything around us, I think it's at that point that we can start to open up and to move on to a different way of knowing the world, a way that is much more based on empathic resonance with the world around us. I think it's at that point that we also will understand that we need something like a ritual, a kind of symbolic behavior, uh, just to, um, uh, yeah, in one way or another, support our existence as a human being.
Yes, I'm actually I'm um, I'm more used to the Chinese tea tradition, where, right, yeah, yeah. where the tea <laughs> uh, resembles more something like hot water. You almost yeah, yeah, don't, you yeah, almost yeah, don't yeah, taste yeah. it, but it's very subtle, very subtle and sublime. And this is something. This is a completely different uh, tea tradition, of course, in which. Yeah. Yeah, it's much more like um, has more to do with strong tastes, uh, completely yeah. the opposite of the of the Chinese tea tradition. But they appreciate it as well. Actually, yeah. they also like it. Yeah. You drink tea at home. You you have like a, a huge collection of it. Yes, I have a huge collection. Yeah? Yes. Really? Yes, I, ha I have two huge collections in my house. And okay. It's a wine collection and a tea collection. And a tea collection. Yes, yes, I like them uh, equally well. Yes, yeah. I like them both. Which one do you drink in the morning? <laughs> oh, I, I during the week I always drink tea. I almost right. never drink wine okay. during the weekend. I sometimes drink one. Yeah, yeah. Accompanied with tea. Yeah, yeah. I often mix the two. I'll drink to that. Yes. The tea is very nice, actually. Right. It is. It's very nice. Quite strong with all the sugar and the mint. Oh. Yes. It's quite strong. Yeah. It's a good kick. Mm. Yes. Let's talk about science, the illusion of objectivity of science. Because we think science is like uh, our new god. I, I think that many people are very naive in thinking about the relationship between numbers and facts. The measurement scale has an enormous impact on uh, the measurement outcome. And that, that's something that we see very clearly, for instance, in the corona crisis, where we see that even counting the number of victims claimed by the virus can be done in so many ways. 95% uh, of something of the uh, casualties of the victim in the United States had, had several other uh, medical conditions. So, will we count them as a victim of the virus or as a victim of one of the other medical conditions? That shows it very clearly, I think, how relative uh, objectivity is in, in the sciences. And we knew that uh, already much longer, actually. Like in 2005, that was about the time that I started to write a PhD. Uh, at, uh, at uh, Ghent University. The so-called replication crisis started, which showed, <laughs> it's very surprising, in certain uh, academic domains, up to 85% of the academic papers, of the academic studies, is not reproducible. That means, to put it in plain words, that uh, the results um, cannot be replicated, mm -hmm. uh, and, and hence, or to be considered non-objective, and of a very limited uh, scientific value. By the way, uh, John Ioannidis uh, wrote a wonderful paper about that, which was titled, um, Why Most Published Research Findings Are False. There was like a, a tragedy of errors in scientific research. That was the, the title of another paper in, in Nature, a tragedy of errors. And um, also that there was much, much more fraud. Fraud on purpose or just by sloppiness? Also on purpose. The researchers often felt pressure to, to publish a lot, and they knew that if they had more spectacular results, that the chance of their paper being published would, uh, would increase. So that was one of the reasons, but not the only reason. It was a much more profound uh, epistemological problem, I think. That was the real basis, the, the root cause of, um, of the problems. And I wrote a book about that oh, seven years ago, mm -hmm. The Pursuit of Objectivity in Psychology. I studied the problem in psychology, but it's very widespread in the sciences. Yes. 85% is fraudulent, in a way, or false? Yes, false. false. Yes, yes, not reproducible. Yes. Yeah, not reproducible. Yes. What can we still believe? That's a very good question. And it shows that the tradition of, of enlightenment, mm -hmm. as it started uh, about uh, maybe five centuries ago, uh, ended up with a serious problem, I think. In, in our society, we situate authority really in academic research. We believe that the rational analysis, the rational and empirical analysis of the world around us is the highest authority. And it turns out that actually this highest authority is highly questionable. And that in most cases, yeah, it's false. So that's, that's, a, that's a serious problem, of course.
how can we fix this, this problem, this problem of false science? I think we'll have to accept in the first place that certain uh, things can never be measured, can never be rationally understood, mm -hmm. can never be entirely objectively studied, and so on. We'll have to accept the limits of science. And then we will have to try to move on. Mm -hmm. to a different view on man and the world, I think, where rationality is not as central as it is yeah. in our contemporary view on man and the world. That's one thing, of course. Mm -hmm. The deeper question is why we stick so much to this rational view on man and the world. Geert van den Bosche told me, uh, which was very interesting as well, is that we focus so much on academia. He worked uh, for pharmaceutical companies and he said a lot of work that's been done there never gets published because they don't want to publish it. Yes, yes the, the problem you are referring to is well known in academia. It's known as the file drawer problem, referring to the fact that if a pharmaceutical company investigates the efficacy of one of its products and the results are negative of the study, they often are not published and they just disappear in the yeah. file drawer. And the opposite is also true. If a pharmaceutical company investigates the efficacy of one of its products and the results are positive, then they often will be published not one time, but ten times. Okay. Yes, of course, which biases the, uh, the, the, the meta-studies based on all these, uh, on all these yes, publications to, a high, to a very high extent. In your book you also talk about numbers, that numbers are very important. If, if, if you, you attach something to a number, people believe it yes. more than they would if you, if you just yes. tell, tell, tell the story. Yes, it's, just, it's a very strange fact, of course. Like, when you measure something, when you express something in numbers, they have a very strange psychological effect. If people see numbers, they believe, they are under the illusion that they see facts. Mm. While, of course, the relationship between numbers and facts is not at all a one-to-one -one relationship. You can measure the same fact in a lot of ways. Yeah. And except strictly unidimensional phenomena, for instance, a straight stack mm -hmm. can be objectively expressed in numbers. Yeah. Uh, but that's, that's, it's very rare in nature. We were constantly confronted with numbers about the number of victims claimed by the virus, mm -hmm. but the number of victims claimed by the measures, by the corona uh, measures, uh, was almost never expressed, in, expressed yeah. in numbers. So this is the most elementary consideration that one can make in such a crisis, namely an elementary cost-benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. What is the cost and what is the benefit of the measures? was never really presented in the mainstream media, which is very strange, of course. And not in which numbers. Very no. And not in numbers. Sometimes the collateral damage of the, of the measures was mentioned, but it was almost never expressed in numbers. And that's exactly the reason, of course, why the collateral damage did not have the same psychological impact as the damage claimed by the corona yeah. victims itself. If you express a phenomenon in numbers, People will believe that they see facts mm -hmm. and they will focus their beliefs and the entire narrative they stick to on that part of reality that is expressed in numbers. And if something, for instance, the collateral damage is not expressed in numbers, it will be as if, or it will have not the same psychological impact. impact. It will be as if it doesn't exist. Interesting, we'll, uh, we'll continue tomorrow. We go from the sea and from uh, Malaga, we go into the mountains. Ah, uh, wonderful. Since you started introducing your theory on mass formation, you've been all around the world. Mm -hmm. Not physically. <laughs> no, no. Yes, it, it has been quite a year. I, um, I think it started uh, with uh, the interview with Rainer Fulmi. I got a lot of invitations afterwards mm -hmm. by quite big uh, 
podcast. Mm. And from there on, it's, it's, yes, it's spread around the world. Uh, yeah. 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 How did this uh, affect you personally and, and, and in your work at the university? I don't think it really changed me personally. It brought a lot of work, of course. Mm -hmm. And a work which I like to do very much and which I enjoy and which is uh, very satisfying. Mm -hmm. It also helps me to develop my ideas, to make my theory more coherent. You're one of a uh, few people, I must say, uh, if you count all over the world, who is speaking out. I think we need to do this in society. If uh, people who have a, a different opinion uh, stop to speak out, then um, there is this suffocating pensée unique mm -hmm. that uh, installs itself in the world, which is never good, uh, but also for myself. It uh, changes me as a person to speak out, I think. Mm -hmm. If you continue to speak out, even when it is difficult, even when you have to go against the group, against the tide, this has a very specific effect on a human being, I think. You have the, the ethical duty, I think, to speak mm -hmm. out and to just to articulate the words of which you think that you are sincere and honest. It's already in the Talmud. If you don't speak out the words that emerge in you in a spontaneous and sincere way, you slowly start to lose your soul. And also, okay. the, op also the opposite holds true, I think. If you do articulate the words that you think are honest words, sincere words, then you slowly start to feel that you exist as a human being. Mm -hmm. It can bring you in trouble to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. um, like at university, it's not easy for me to speak out at university. I notice that many people don't like it. But at the same time... Many people, meaning well, your colleagues? Most of my colleagues, yes. Most of my colleagues uh, prefer not to be associated with me anymore. Okay. There is freedom of speech at university. Mm. There really is. Mm. You haven't been pressed into a corner? No, you feel there is group pressure. pressure. You feel there is group pressure. Yes. And, and you, you feel the group pressure. No one will tell you that you, you're not allowed to speak out. Mm -hmm. I think for medical doctors it's much more difficult than, for instance, for professors. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. of course, most people just, also mentally, just believe in the mainstream narrative. They go along with it. Yeah, but there's also a group that does believe, but doesn't speak out. Yes, of course. Does, of course. Doesn't this make you mad that you're standing there alone in, with a lot of headwinds? So there are more people that, uh, who, who know and who feel, or who have the impression at least that there is something wrong with the mainstream narrative, also at university, but they, who, who won't speak out indeed because they prefer to take the easy way and, mm -hmm. and just uh, uh, remain silent. Mm -hmm. um, yes, sometimes it, uh, it makes me mad a little bit because you would expect that, if that highly intelligent people would be able to see uh, the mistakes oh, oh. and the flaws in the yeah. statistics and so At on. At least have some critical thinking about it. And most don't. And that, that's one of the most remarkable things about mass formation, of course, that the higher the level of education, the more vulnerable people are for, are for it. Another thing is, it's kind of a trait of yours to speak out. Does, does this run in, in, in the family? Is it something that's... Uh, that the, uh, the family dismet always has done? Or is it uh, something you have learned to yes. do? It runs in the family, yes. Generations, there are these stories about um, people in our family who, uh, who, who spoke out 200, 300 years ago. Well, that was not in line with, uh, with the religious discourse. And they had to move out of the, out of the village. Okay. <laughs> they had to live somewhere else. Right, they were yeah. pushed out of the village. They were pushed out of the village, yes that as a child they, 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 well, they probably will have had a huge impact on me. Okay. And uh, from when I was small, um, I always spoke out. Yes, also at school. Yeah, frankly. If, yeah. If, if, yes, fr in, a, in, a, in a quiet way, I think. Yeah. But I, I, I always refuse to shut up. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and also at university now, in the 15 years um, that I was working at university before the crisis started, well, I made my PhD on, on, on problems with the academic research, showing all the, the mistakes, the flaws, the, 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 the sloppiness in, in, the, in, in the research. And many of my colleagues were mad uh, with me already. Okay. Because I, because I, I, I showed and I revealed yeah. uh, the problems with, uh, with academic research, uh, which I think uh, is, is, is the duty of everyone who is working yeah. at university. And at a certain moment, a few, a few months ago, um, someone at university, I, I won't mention her name, but 
Oh, asked, it's a her. It's a her. Yes. <laughs> she asked me, but Matthias, she, she, she said, uh, we just doubt whether you still identify with the University of Ghent. I answered her, I don't think it's my duty to identify with the University of Ghent. I just think it's my duty to speak out as honest and as, and as sincere as possible as a professor. Uh -huh. That's the, the, the core of science for me. And I think that's true. Uh -huh. too, too many people uh, identify with institutions or with, with the mainstream narrative or something. That's not what you should do as a, as, a, as a human being. In the first place, you should try to know uh, or try to have an opinion on what's, uh, on what's true on what, and, and, uh, or false and just speak out as honest as possible. That's the only ethical it, duty we have. Is there something behind you holding you know, like like with the Romans and saying, you're mortal, you're mortal. <laughs> Do we need that? What can give us the strength to face our mortality uh, is exactly this courage to speak uh, in a honest way, even when it is dangerous or even when uh, people are angry, angry with you for what you say, just to continue in a quiet way to tell what you think, being also careful that uh, you don't speak out in such a way that the people who admire you um, want you to speak out. That's not what you have to do. Mm -hmm. You just have to care in the first place for the value of your words uh, and not for the people who are listening to you or who are, uh, or, or not for the, for the response of, uh, of the other people. I'll take that into consideration. Yes, one of your big influences was Anna Arendt. She wrote about the banality of evil. People don't see that they're evil. They think they're doing good. That's one of the major characteristics of uh, totalitarianism, I think, mm -hmm. which also distinguishes it from a classical dictatorship. In a totalitarian state, the totalitarian leaders typically believe that they do their utmost best. They are convinced that they should reshape society mm -hmm. in order to build like a new paradise. Yeah. And they always start from a kind of pseudo-scientific theory to do so. We've seen this in communism, we've seen this in Nazism. And I think we, we, see, we see this again. Everything has to change, mm -hmm. everything has to reshape according to a new ideology in order to be able to deal with uh, the problems, uh, real or imagined, that, uh, that emerge in society. Yeah. Away with the old, let's get something new and you have to listen. Such a movement sometimes starts from the elite, like mm -hmm. in, in uh, the Soviet Union, uh, there was first a, a communist elite who started from uh, the ideology of Marx, what Hannah Arendt calls this diabolic pact between the elite and the masses, mm -hmm. uh, which allowed them to seize control in society and to, to, to build a new kind of state, the communist state, which yeah. indeed the banality of evil manifested. Under the Tsars, there were, there were about like I think 50 or 70, something like that, death penalties a year. And after 10 years in communism, there were over 20,000. And after 20 years, there were over 200,000 death penalties each year, which showed, each year. Yeah, each year, which showed how all these good intentions from the beginning yeah. uh, actually were not realized. <laughs> Instead of uh, creating a better society, it was much, much, much worse. That's much so worse. typical for totalitarianism. one of the strangest characteristics of the phenomenon of mass formation and of the phenomenon of totalitarianism, uh -huh. that both the leaders and the followers, but also the victims, the victims, the victims yeah. of a totalitarian state, usually or very willingly go along uh, with, um, uh, with a totalitarian project. Uh, Eichmann, yeah. who indeed uh, tried to convince the Jewish people uh, to cooperate with them. Yeah. And, and Hannah Arendt says in her book uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem, uh, she says that it was maybe surprising that uh, Eichmann had this idea of trying to convince his victims to cooperate with him. Yeah. But what was even more astonishing, Hannah Arendt says, that the victims actually collaborated, that, yeah. they, that, they, that they went along. And it were not only the Jews, but they're only the, the people, the, the, the victims of Stalin and the other victims of, of Hitler in a remarkable way. They all very obediently and willingly and willingly went like lambs with the to the slaughterhouse. Like, long, like lambs to the slaughterhouse. And there is also always a certain part of of, uh, of, of the victims 
who knows what's going on and who refuses to cooperate and who try to wake up mm-hmm. uh, uh, their fellow victims and who usually don't succeed. There are many letters preserved from the Second World War of Jewish people who try to warn their fellow uh, Jewish uh, citizens, like, like, don't go to that train, it, it yeah. will bring you to your funeral. And they typically were reproached um, that they were conspiracy thinkers, even then already. Oh, okay. Yes, there was this woman in Berlin who wrote several letters to Jewish people and uh, time and time again they reproached her that she was much too conspicuous. Uh, She stopped uh, to try to convince the other people because she felt that it was just hopeless. They just didn't want to see what was going on. Is this a result of group pressure? I I guess you're familiar with the the ASH experiment which which, which shows for instance what even a small group can have on the mental functioning of of, of individuals. The the ASH experiments are very simple actually and also very interesting in this respect. And um, he asked small groups of eight people uh, to give him the answer to a simple question. He showed three lines on the left part of a board and then uh, three lines with a different length, 10 centimeter, 50 centimeter and one meter for instance. And then he showed a fourth line of 50 centimeters. <laughs> and he asked uh, the participants one by one, which one of the first three lines is as long as the fourth line? And even a child could see, of course, that it was the, the, the middle line, yeah, of the yeah. first three lines that, that was as long as the fourth line. But seven of the eight people in the group were collaborators of, of Ash. Ash asked them first, yeah. which line do you think is equally long as the fourth line? And the first seven people all gave the wrong answer. They all said, answered that the first line of 10 centimeters was as long as the second line of actually 50 centimeters. So only 25% of the real participants gave the right answer. Yeah. 75% of them all followed went the along. first seven, went along with the first seven people and just gave the wrong answer. And upon being asked why they gave the wrong answer, that was also very interesting. Uh, uh, half of them said like, well, uh, we knew that the answer was wrong, but we didn't dare to go against uh, the rest yeah. of the group. Yeah. That's uh, but, but, peer pressure, yeah. Yes, but, but, but a, a substantial percentage uh, said that upon hearing that, seven people in a row thought that the, the first line had the same length as the fourth line, they started to believe that it was actually true. Okay. So that's extremely interesting. And that's part of the explanation of, phenom- of the phenomenon of mass formation. But there is much more in a, in a large-scale uh, phenomenon of mass formation, such as the ones that lead to totalitarianism. There is much more than that. It's not only group pressure. So it's not about money, because sometimes they say, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, so, some people get rich of it, or some people, you know, they, they have an advantage. I think that Hannah Arendt was one of the few people, maybe even the only one who really understood. She said, even the totalitarian leaders do what they do because of the money, even not because of the power, she said. Because in the end, also the leaders are radically willing to self-sacrifice themselves. And then we are talking about the public leaders of the masses. And the public leaders of the masses, the people who articulate the narrative that leads to the mass formation in public space. They are convinced that uh, society should be reshaped according to one or another race theory, for instance, as mm-hmm. in Germany. Or here, in this case, I think, we are dealing with people who are convinced of a technocratic ideology, even a transhumanist ideology. Yeah. So the leaders usually fanatically believe yeah. in the ideology. If we look now uh, at Russia, yes. uh, at Putin, yes. uh, do you think this is a typical authoritarian guy? Does he have his, his people also in this mass hypnosis? I definitely don't believe that hit, that um, uh, put, put <laughs> I, I, I hope Freud doesn't yeah, 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 to, yeah. to the to the Putler. To, to the, to the, to the Putler. <laughs> Putin in my opinion is a uh, authoritarian Autorita, yeah and maybe even a dictator you could it uh, depends I think mm-hmm. uh, but he's not a totalitarian leader because because uh, be it only for this reason that he doesn't uh, start from this pseudo-scientific ideology uh, which he believes should be imposed to society, should reshape uh, society. Uh, that's not what, that's not, that's not typical of Putin. And I also don't think that, he's, um, that his, his strategy relies in the first place on indoctrination and propaganda. this uh, uh, documentary series, Headwind, we are the counter mass formation. We think we're uh, critical thinkers. We think that of ourselves. That's an arrogance too. We are constantly at the risk of uh, mass formation and sometimes we probably fall prey to that to a certain extent. And it's uh, what we have to make sure is that we always can escape, that we can take a little bit of a critical, of a critical distance of our own position and uh, remain capable to be critical both 
uh, towards the narrative, the, the mainstream narrative, and towards our own narrative. Yeah. That's the yeah. challenge we... Yeah. Keep the bird's view. Yes, yeah. indeed. Anna Arendt uh, said in her book that the new form of totalitarianism would be totally different from the ones we knew before. In 1951, she mentioned already that uh, we've witnessed uh, uh, the fall of Nazism, we would soon witness the fall of uh, Stalinism, she expected. But she said, uh, we might uh, see that a new kind of totalitarianism emerges. And this totalitarianism, she said, will not be a fascist totalitarianism or a communist totalitarianism led by gang members such as Stalin or Hitler, but it might be a technocratic totalitarianism, she said. She didn't use the word technocratic at that stage. She, she just said it might be a, techno, a, a totalitarianism which is led by, by dull bureaucrats and bureaucrats, technocrats, yeah. which, which is exactly yeah. what we understand now under technocratic totalitarianism. Yeah. Uh, George Orwell as well, uh, in his book 1984. I believe that the essence of a technocratic totalitarianism is that it believes that the problems of society can only be dealt with uh, extreme technological control of yeah. society. Uh, the most purest um, uh, example of a technocratic ideology is of course the transhumanist ideology, yeah. which believes that the human being can merge with all kinds of technological devices and become godlike actually. If you, if you, if you read the books uh, of um, Harari, Yuval yeah. Harari, uh, which is, I think, the most successful author at the moment in non-fiction books. Um, he describes this kind of, of future in which uh, the human being emerges with, with all kinds of technological devices be, and becomes omnipotent in many respects, becomes godlike. That's, uh, yeah. that's why, the, why the title of his book, of course, uh, yeah. Homo Deus. If you look at the causal chain, uh, which leads to totalitarianism, then you see that the first step always is this mechanist thinking. Yeah. It's this belief that the entire universe can be understood, in mechanistic terms, uh, can be completely rationally understood. Yeah. That rational understanding should be the cornerstone of human society and human existence. It's this kind of thinking that in itself already isolates the human being from its environment. Because if you think like that, if you believe that everything around you can be reduced to, 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 to the categories of your own logical thinking, then you are not able anymore to open up for the mystery of the things behind you, for the uniqueness, from the singu for the singularity of the things around you, because on the beforehand, you expect already that you will be able to understand them in your own way of thinking. That's the first yeah. important thing. And then in the second step, of course, it was this kind of mechanistic thinking that led to an excessive uh, industrialization of the world and an excessive um, uh, use of technology. technology. And what we in, see in, now, yeah. yeah. What we see now. And then and in my book, I describe how it is exactly this use of technology and this excessive industrialization of the world, which leads to a people who feel disconnected from their natural and their social environment. The root cause of the problem of totalitarianism is always the mechanistic thinking. So, yeah. what we should uh, overcome or, or, or is, this uh, mechanistic is this mechanistic thinking? Uh, a lot of scientists and, and, and big scientists uh, already said this. All seminal scientists, all great scientists, or almost all, uh, Heisenberg, Schrödinger, Boer, Max Planck, uh, Lorenz, Wandelbrot, uh, Janos Boljai, uh, and so on, René Tom, they all started from this mechanist view on man and the world, from this rationalist view on man and the world, but in the end, they all left it behind. They evolved. They evolved because they noticed, and that might sound paradoxical, but it isn't, no. that they showed in a strictly rational way that reality, in the end, for instance, all complex dynamical systems, which is almost uh, every phenomenon in nature, yeah. in the end, behaves strictly, strictly irrational. Chaos. Ch it's chaos. There's it, beauty in the chaos. There's beauty in the chaos, and the nice thing is that Chaos theory, systems theory has described this in a wonderful way. It's this resonating kind of knowledge that can make you feel the eternal principles, which can never, never really be logically grasped, that exist in this seemingly chaotic world that cannot be grasped, that never can be entered in a rational way. In my own life, personally, I've experienced this in a very concrete way. It took me until I was 35 years old before I suddenly realized that the world is not rational. But the more you try to grasp the essence of certain phenomena, in the same way as the seminal scientists did, the more you see that the core and the essence of life can never behaves irrationally. If you think in a logical way, you connect the, logical, the one logical idea to the other. 
And in this way, it, it is as if you build a wall around you, a wall of logical understanding, which isolates you from the world. Yeah. And as soon as you understand that this logical wall will never be sufficient... The bricks to, will come down. <laughs> the bricks will come down. That there, and as soon as you can allow yourself, uh, allow your logical thinking to open up, it's almost literally as if the strings inside of you yeah. start to resonate yeah. with the eternal music of life around you. And it's this resonating knowledge that is the true knowledge, and that also allows you to overcome, I think, what might be the major disease of our current contemporary culture, is the fear, fear. of death. Is the fear of death. Because the, as soon as you tremble together, mm -hmm. as soon as you vibrate in the eternal music of life, you know that death is not the end of everything. You know that you're, that you're part of something eternal. We went from physics to metaphysics. I think this is a good time to go from grapes to wine. <laughs> yes. Let's visit the vineyards. <laughs> As the Romans said, in vino veritas, the truth is in the wine. That's true. Yes. We're here in this typical Andalusian vineyard. It looks different than a French or an Italian because we're here at about 1100 meters high. It gets really, really hot in summer. The leaves have to cover the grapes. Mm -hmm. The other way around. They want it's to the create shade and... They need shade yeah. and you can see they're still, uh, they're still little now. Okay. Little. Oh, they are here, yes. There they are. the little grapes, yes. There they are. Why are we here? Because you're a wine lover. Yes, I am. Uh, I am. You yes. are. For me, the, the, the most fascinating thing about wine, something that is extremely sensitive uh, for all kinds of psychological factors. Yeah. For instance, if you learn to taste wine, then you know that every time you learn a new term to describe the taste of wine, the flavor of wine, the, the, the scent of wine, then you start to taste it differently, the wine. It's like, very curious. You need, in one way or another, uh, um, a symbolic framework in order to be able to taste and smell wine. In, or in any case, the taste and the smell of the wine will change every time you know you, you learn. You learn. Yes, definitely. Term. It's an experience that almost everybody has who, um, who, who learns to taste wine. So language really influences the way you taste? Language influences perception. Yeah. And that's so important, I think, also in general in life. We are not aware of that usually. We don't know that the narratives we believe in will create our reality. Mm -hmm. And also in the crisis we are going through now, uh, we have to realize that the narratives we believe in will create our perception, will create how we perceive the world, how we see the world. The facts confirm our narrative, but it's also the other way around. Our narrative creates the fact. It determines, to a certain extent, not entirely, of course, but what we perceive and how we perceive the world. So that's something very important, I think. And also from another perspective, I really love wine, uh, and it also has to do with psychology. Um, wine is a very complex uh, phenomenon. It changes while it uh, gets older and so on. So wine is a perfect metaphor for human experience and for human personality types. I have the feeling that every personality type uh, matches a certain type of wine. There are the certain wines that are very good when they are young, but they become sour when they get older. Okay, other, yeah. wines, other wines uh, become softer and more elegant while, while they get older. Other wines lose their energy. Every wine, in one way or another, is a perfect metaphor for a certain personality type. And every, per and every personality, every human being, every uh, subject uh, will find uh, uh, a wine that, that really matches himself, that, that suits himself, that, that has the same characteristics in a certain way. I think that's one of the reasons why wine always fascinated uh, uh, mankind so much. Um, yeah. And you can keep it before, before they knew here how to uh, stop the fermentation of the wine. Mm. Because with the heat, mm. when, they, when they made the wine, uh, it became really uh, easily uh, vinegar. Mm. Because the, the, yes. they couldn't stop the fun. Can imagine, yes. Mm. So the first wines who came from Malaga mm. were very popular. At the mm. Russian court, for instance, mm. they imported uh, Malaga wines mm. because here they cut it with brandy. Oh, yes. And he so created a kind, of port, a kind of port wine. Well, it's, it's, it's a fortified wine, yeah. just to stop, because yeah, if you go uh, yes, yes, uh, yes. above, I think it's 16 degrees no, alcohol. 15, 15 degrees alcohol, yeah. and the fermentation stops, yes. That's yes. it. That's it. That, that's, so the first wines yeah. who were made here, yeah were like fortified wines, and they could yeah. keep forever. Yeah. They could oh, keep yes, forever. yes, 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 wonderful. And that's yes. why the uh, yes. Malaga wine was exported all over yeah. the world.
Matthias, we're here in a stunning, beautifully nature. Do you love nature? Is it necessary for you to be in nature? It's very important for me. It makes me aware of uh, the fact that I belong to uh, an overarching system, and maybe system is not the right word. Maybe it's better to, to speak about an organism, or in any case, something alive. You're mm -hmm. part of something that is bigger than us. And as a, as a human being, we are not meant to to live in a disconnected way. Mm. And nature is humbling, isn't it? Nature is humbling, yes. Yeah. It can make you feel small, or at least it can make you feel aware of, of, the, of the right proportions in life, yeah. yes. Let's recapitulate on uh, mass formation. What is mass formation? Uh, mass formation is a very specific kind of group formation, which has very specific effects at the level of individual mental functioning. For instance, when someone is in the grip of a, of a process of mass formation, of this specific group formation, then he, he or she becomes radically blind for uh, everything that goes against uh, the beliefs of the group. So. The, um, and, and the second very important characteristic of mass formation is that it makes people willing to radically sacrifice everything that used to be important for them before the mass formation. It is as if people are no longer aware of their own individual egoistic interest. Uh, and then a third, also very important characteristic, is that people who are in the grip of mass formation typically become radically intolerant for dissonant voices. And this can go quite far. In the end... They Sounds will... familiar. Yes, <laughs> and in the end they will typically stigmatize everyone who doesn't yeah. go along with them and ultimately commit cruelties to everyone who is not in the mass and they do so as if it is an ethical duty to do so. It's very characteristic for mass formation. Uh, this kind of group formation uh, only occurs under very specific conditions. Mm -hmm. And for instance, just before the corona crisis, this was definitely the case. Over 30% of the uh, population worldwide reported not to have one single uh, close contact. And then once people feel disconnected, um, they will typically start to be confronted with experiences of lack of meaning making. Mm. It will be as if their life is without purpose. 60% of the people worldwide reported uh, that they considered their job to be completely meaningless. Yeah. So that, that uh, oh, the bullshit jobs, the, the so-called bullshit jobs. Yes, yes. And once people feel socially disconnected and or confronted with experiences of a lack of meaning making, something specific happens at the affective level, mm -hmm. they will typically experience so-called free-floating uh, anxiety, frustration and aggression. Meaning a kind of anxiety, frustration and aggression in which someone doesn't know what he feels anxious, frustrated and aggressive for. Which is a very aversive mental state. Because if you feel anxious, you don't yeah. know why you feel anxious. You don't if you're know. attacked by a lion, you know why you're, yeah, yes, why yes. you're afraid. Yes, and you can <laughs> consider strategies yeah. to run away from yeah. the lion. Yeah. But if you don't know what you're anxious for, then you, then you feel completely out of control. Yeah. Then all this freely floating anxiety might suddenly connect to the object of anxiety in the narrative and there might be a huge willingness to participate in a strategy to deal with the object of anxiety, no matter how absurd this narrative okay. might be. And in the next step, something even more important happens. A new kind of social bond emerges, because many people participate uh, in the strategy to deal with the object of anxiety. At the same time, there is like a collective heroic battle with the object okay. of anxiety, and people feel connected okay. again. Yeah. And it's exactly that was the, the root cause of, of the of the mass formation was exactly the state of disconnectedness. Yeah. For instance, in the, during the corona crisis, they were all talking about solidarity, but at the same time they accepted that if their neighbor got an accident yeah. on the street, yeah. they were no longer allowed to help him, mm -hmm. unless they had, by accident, surgical gloves and a surgical yeah. mask yeah. at their disposal, yeah. which means never. If their parents were dying, they were not allowed to visit them. People accepted that. Yeah. Totalitarian states, which were always based on mass formation, in the end always end up in a radically paranoid atmosphere in which individuals are willing to report each other, even the people that they used to love a lot before mm -hmm. the mass formation, 
to the government. Yeah. A woman of Iran I was talking with a few months ago, she lived in Iran during the revolution in 1979, and uh, she told me that she had seen with her own eyes how a mother reported her son to the state because she thought he was not loyal enough to the state. Wow. And how uh, she hung the rope around his neck just before literally. he was hung. Literally. Literally hung the rope around his neck before he was hung. And how she claimed to be a heroine for doing so. Scary. Yeah. To get this message over, mm. you need a lot of propaganda, no? Mass formation can emerge in a spontaneous way, mm -hmm. but it usually will not continue to exist without the constant repetition of the narrative mm -hmm. through something like the mass media. Actually, to in this way, they constantly re-hypnotize yeah. the people a little bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mass media are, are a necessary uh, ingredient or component yeah. for large-scale and long-term mass formation to exist. At the end of the 15th century, the Catholic kings had their reconquista. They uh, came here and they ousted the, uh, the Moorish uh, people. They wanted to win the hearts and the souls of the people who lived there for about 800 years. To thank the city of Alama and to show their appreciation, they built the first hospital here in Andalusia uh, for the people of Alama. There was uh, this uh, woman called Elena de Cespet. She was a uh, daughter of a slave and, and uh, a native from here. And uh, she wanted to become a surgeon. But at that time, you couldn't become a surgeon as a woman. Mm -hmm. uh, so she dressed up like a man. And she was the first uh, uh, transsexual, actually, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to be mentioned in a book because Cervantes, the Spanish mm. writer, mm. came here, visited Alama de Granada because he was a tax collector mm. at that time, mm. uh, and uh, heard this story and, uh, and, and, and wrote a book about it, about mm. her. And so she's the first really transsexual woman uh, who was mentioned uh, in a book. She was also ousted uh, out of, this, uh, out of this, this town. There was like an inquisition and, and stuff like that. And you see that also in these times, it was very hard to be uh, mm -hmm. a different and to have a different opinion mm -hmm. or a different sexuality. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it, in, in some respects, it didn't change that much until now. But the consequences are maybe less severe at the moment, but... Yeah, still, well, they didn't kill still, her. <laughs> they no, they kill didn't kill her, her. No. But people are still uh, uh, finding it difficult to tolerate uh, other voices and other... Yeah. To, to, or to, be, to be tolerant to, uh, to dissonant voices, even now. What's That's something typical for a human being. Yeah, what another. surprises me, and this brings me to the woke movement, mm. uh, which we are uh, living in, in, in these days, is that, because I, I, I called her Elena, mm. but I have, that's her dead name, they would say now. Yes, yes. They would say now, yes. that's her dead name. That's her dead name. Because her new name, uh, mm -hmm. uh, under which she was known here, was Eleno, mm -hmm. which is just, you know, the, the male version of uh, Elena at, at that time. Uh, but you see that the, the pendulum goes always the other way, and when we see that with woke, that it goes yes, goes indeed. far out, indeed. and hopefully, hopefully, it will swing it back. Will swing back, indeed. Yes, let's hope so. Yes. So the tolerance of intolerance can also be intolerant. Of course, it is. I think it is. Yes, the woke movement is a, is a, is a very nice example. Huh? Somewhere it started from. Well, also from good intentions, I think. Yeah. But in the end, it becomes something that um, that makes um, public space a, a difficult and a dangerous space to speak out for everyone who even only a little bit um, deviates from mm -hmm. the group norm. Yeah. Uh, and it yeah. becomes absurd. At, at it moment. becomes absurd. It well, becomes absurd. radically absurd. But there's also good news. Every revolution will eat its own With children. Them. Every mass becomes a monster that devours its own children, yeah. uh, Hannah Arendt said. Let's take a walk to the gorge that reminds me of Ronda. We'll, we'll have a yeah. look at it. Wonderful.
But yes, we're here in front of a small cave dedicated to the Senora de los Angeles. The Moorish were uh, ousted here at about 1498 out of uh, Alama. And what does a new religion need? A new religion needs a good story. And uh, a good story is a miracle. Mm. And so there was this, the story is there was a knight on a horse. He fell down on his horse. <laughs> There's still a hoof print uh, in, a, in a rock there, uh, they say. And, but he survived. Miraculously, he survived. And he built this little chapel as a Hail Mary. Mm. Mm. Stories are important mm. not only for religion, but for society in its whole. Are we losing the big stories? Are we losing that uh, in modern society after enlightenment? The big stories or the grand narratives yeah. that disappeared. Maybe the only grand narrative that is remaining now is the, the grand narrative of the materialist the view on man and the world. Mm -hmm. The grand narrative which says that everything started with the Big Bang and all the rest uh, was a kind of a mechanistic consequence of that Big Bang. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this grand narrative that believes that uh, everything uh, can be reduced to uh, material processes. Mm -hmm. Even um, the, the feelings and um, thoughts in our head, human consciousness within that grand narrative. The ghost in the machine? The ghost in the machine would just be um, an effect of uh, the biochemical processes in our brain. Yeah. That's what we seem to believe. The strange thing is that we believe that this idea is a, a scientific idea. But at the same time, we see that science itself shows that uh, this kind of thinking is very limited. Uh, it shows that the, uh, the material particles itself um, are, are, to a large extent, a consequence of our consciousness, the other way around. That's what someone like uh, uh, Heisenberg concluded. He said, science finally concluded um, that Plato was right. Plato, who believed uh, that the material world in itself is a kind of uh, consciousness in itself, that all material particles are thought forms, he said. Mm -hmm. So we see that in that way, this entire materialist striving to reduce human consciousness to material processes actually can never be really uh, successful. We believe that rational understanding is the most important thing in life and that our society and all human relationships, so human living together, should be based on rational understanding. I don't believe that's true. I don't believe that's true. I believe that, in the end, what science made clear is that rational understanding is extremely limited. Mm -hmm. And uh, that we can only explain a very limited part of reality in a rational way, uh, and that for the rest, we have to move on and try to know the world in a different way. To and feel it more. Right? To feel it more. Um, different scientists have uh, articulated that in a, in a different way. Someone as Niels Bohr said uh, that in the end, poetic language has much more grip on reality and is much more important to understand reality or to, um, to talk about reality than logical language. It's hard to to, to put in words. Yeah. We have to feel it to a certain extent. That's exactly yeah, that's it. Is, are, are, we, are we reaching the, the limits of, of speech? This kind of knowledge that you could compare it to what the ancient Greeks called the techne, with which they re referred to a certain technical knowledge um, that is more than just rational knowledge. For instance, if someone learns a certain craft, then first there is this stage in which he, he can learn the craft just by rational understanding. Mm -hmm. Someone can explain him, yeah. like you can do this in that way, this in that way. You, like have, to, you have to go through these yeah. steps, to th these protocols. When you start to feel what you have to do. The creativity. Yes, the creativity. And when, you, when there is this connection, there's this more mm -hmm. intuitive connection mm -hmm. with the objects that you're making, for instance, mm -hmm. or, with, or, or with the performance of the art, it's, it's at that moment that you reach a higher level of knowing, a higher level of understanding, which is much more a resonating knowledge. In Japan, there is this famous quote, which says, first you have to protect the rules of an art, and then you have to destroy them. And it's at that moment that you become an artist. Breaking the mold. We're back yeah. at Picasso here. We're back at Picasso, definitely. There's another thing that's very important, the fear mm. of dying. 
in this materialistic world mm. has grown. It has grown definitely. But in our culture, we can no longer tolerate the idea of dying. Mm -hmm. uh, it is as if dying doesn't have a place anymore in our way of looking yeah. at the world. As soon as you become aware that your logical understanding will never be sufficient, you can all these ideas can loosen up a little bit. There becomes a certain distance between the ideas, and you start to be capable, I think, to resonate just like a string, almost literally. That's what I explain in my book uh, on um, uh, the psychology of totalitarianism, that uh, the human body, in a certain way, truly is a string instrument. It vibrates. It vibrates. You have the muscles that are uh -huh. over the skeleton, and, and, and they, they, they can vibrate. When you enclose yourself in logical constructions, you stop vibrating and resonating mm -hmm. with the, the music of life around you. All these things go hand in hand, I think. I think that it is at the moment that you can transcend logical thinking, that you start to be aware of the fact that there is much more than rational understanding. I think it's exactly at this moment that you start to resonate with the world around you. And it is at this moment that you start to feel something of the eternity of life around you. I always say the eternal music of life around you. And that's exactly what you need, I think, to just be able to tolerate the idea that once you will die, because you feel that you still participate in something eternal. Science is a wonderful thing. And we went through a wonderful process throughout the last few hundred years. But we also have to transcend it. We also have to go further. We have to realize that there is something beyond rational understanding. And that's exactly the fact that we sooner or later will die. And that's exactly also the moment at, you, at which we will be capable to really live this life. Mm -hmm. Because if you're too yeah, scared yeah. of death, you, are, you, you cannot live your life, uh, fully live your life. Are you um, a religious man? And I don't mean that you believe in God, but in the, the, the literal way of relire, to connect, to connect these uh, people, to connect with nature. I definitely don't expect too much of uh, dogmatic religion and institutionalized religion, but I believe that the original, uh, the seminal religious experience was a very fruitful experience. It was very necessary for, for culture. And as you, as you just remark in an etymological sense, it means something like to connect with things around us. Yes, of course. In that way, I am a religious man, and I believe that a religious experience is the core of our existence in that respect, in not that in respect, respect, not in a dogmatic or institutionalized no. uh, respect. In the end, science arrives where religion once started. And a connection with that, but transcends all logical understanding. And you also refer to the concept of God there. Mm. But it's not really a belief in God, it's just feeling in touch. It's right, just right to say with that, what transcends all rational understanding, all logical understanding. Mm. Amen to that, Matthias de Smet. Thank you very much for coming to Andalusia, to Spain, and for bringing your wisdom. And thank you for inviting me. It was great to talk. And some consequences gather. They gather around the fire. They came this way from far today to question and inquire. Evil spreads. Somebody said, round here and over there We could react to this attack If only we would dare Dare to love Dare to understand Dare to care Dare to love a man dare to love